Hello, welcome to Biggest Little Library. I'm Tammy Ruff. And I'm Amy Newberry. We're your two librarians discussing all the books in the stacks. The new and notable. The lost and forgotten. The hot and the not. (laughs) That's right. So listeners, we have a special format for you today. We've got Jamie Stone joining us for our discussion on poetry because... April is National Poetry Month. It is. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you. (laughs) Before we get started, just a quick reminder, please head over to our website to subscribe to our newsletter. We don't spam your inbox, we promise, but it's the best way to stay on top of everything Biggest Little Library, like episode content, blog roundups, Friday for things we love, and special updates, because we actually have a lot of things happening. We do. Okay. Amy and Jamie, I know. what's the news? What is what's the news? Going on? Jay, Jay, what is going on with you? Well, um, we just finished watching the entire series of Parks and Rec. We're a little late to the game, I oh realize. Really? Yeah. So you know who little Sebastian is. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. Um, I started watching them on like Peacock, I think. Yeah. Oh no, I know what happened. I started watching them on Netflix. Maybe like late summer, early fall. And there was a little note that said they were taking them away Mm, at the end of October, I think. So uh, Rob was a very good husband and bought me the DVD series for my birthday. So we just finished watching the whole series, which was super fun. And then uh, since we're talking on a podcast about books, I just finished listening to Amy Poehler's memoir, Yes, Please, which was super fun to listen to because she pulls in some guest appearances and she has some other people read um, some of the chapters and she pulls in one of the uh, creators of Parks and Rec with her on that chapter. So it was super fun to listen to. That is oh, so that's cool. cool. That was in our Galentine's yes. blog on, yeah. Yeah, yes, on our I Patreon site. Yeah, yeah, so that's so cool. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, okay, Tams, what's going on with you? Well, since you mentioned, Jamie, about what you were watching, we just finished up um, on Netflix. It's called The World's Hardest Race. World's toughest race world's you, toughest race you struggle with that title. Uh, i know <laughs> and it has bear grills do you, i don't know if you remember I bear grills bear he was grills. man versus yeah. wild or something like yeah. that yeah he's the host and it's a little bit sort of like um survivor it has the same uh, producer so that you know the tiki idols there and the you know nobody's voted off or anything like that but it it's incredible there's 66 teams of four people and they are in uh fiji and they did it in 2019, and it's the first time since, like, I don't know, 2002 or something wow. like that. Amazing. Absolutely amazing to watch. So that's what we watched. Okay, I'm not going to talk about something i watched, although I have been watching a lot of things, which I will address at some later date. You mentioned you got a DVD, right? And I'm, I'm giggling because the second you said that... I, when you guys brought over my birthday gift, which was a long time ago, I showed it to Kevin. I'm like, I got a CD. Rob made me a mixtape of all these rap songs. Oh my songs. gosh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I know. And I was totally digging it. And so Kevin and I were looking at all the songs. I'm like, this is awesome. He's like, how are we going to play it? And I go, well, doesn't the car have a CD player? He goes, I don't think it does. We didn't even know. So I get in the car. Sure enough no CD player. I look at him. I'm like, this sounds like a Kevin problem. You got to sort this business out. So then I came home one day and he's like, I had to dig out old technology. He's like, I went downstairs and I had a CD and he plugged it all in. He got it all moved over. And he's (laughs) like, I want to show you where you can find it on your phone. So he had totally downloaded it. And I'm just giggling because I'm like, I don't even think I have a DVD player. So if Kevin got me like Parks and Rec via DVD, like it wouldn't happen. Apparently we're old school at our house. Hey, we are too. That's have you good. have you listened to the mix yet? No, I haven't because here's the deal. Here's the deal. I want it to be like the primo time. It's got to be like a road trip. And I said to Kevin, goes, this is going to be great on the boat. And I go, oh. I might even hold it for that. Rob, I don't know. It, it's got to be like beginning to end, I guess is what I'm saying. I so. think that's a smart move because, <clears throat> yeah. you know, he put some thought into what he put on that mix I, for you. And so I think listening from beginning to end thoughtfully. Yeah. No skippy. No skippy. Can I just tell you, Kevin was really excited about it. So we're nerding out. So. <laughs> I think that's hilarious because that was so a thing. Of it, course, it was in our generation. Yeah, yeah. it was cassette tapes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, me too. Yeah. Yeah. The playlist, super fun. I, I will say my car has a CD player in it. Still. <laughs> so if we need a road trip to listen to another one, I'll drive. <laughs> I know. Okay. 
We need to talk about poetry today. We do. Poor Rob needs a microphone over there just so you can chime in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's making, he's miming all That's these right. things. This poor guy. So let's talk a little bit of poetry. Before we get started, though, I have some questions for you ladies. Okay. Because I know that when we decided to do poetry, we may have had a little bit like, Tammy, you may have made a little bit of a face. I probably did. So I want to know, what do you guys, when somebody mentions the word poetry, what what immediately comes to mind? What immediately springs to your mind? Let's start with you, Tams. That I'm not good at poetry. And it, I think it's hard for me to really access. And the second a teacher in high school or not really in college, I would say I didn't take any classes, you know, that, that talked about poetry, but... I feel like that you read it and I'm going, I don't know what it has to say, or I miss, you know, the illusions or allegories or metaphors or whatever. Right. And I'm just like, I don't know. I, it just is. So a lot is of it this like sort intimidating? Of me. Yeah, completely. Okay. Sort of a fear of it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's our geography history teacher. T- mm-hmm. or Jay, now what do you think of it? Because you teach English, so. Right. So I have a little different perspective on it, I guess, but I totally understand that feeling because teaching kids poetry, a lot of them are intimidated when they see that that's something we might be doing in class and they think it's going to be something they're not going to get. It's going to be complex and it doesn't have to be. And I think some of the poetry that I enjoy really doesn't have to be. And I know Ames, you really love William Carlos Williams. Oh my gosh. And I do too. And I think that's his whole, his whole idea was to make it accessible, to make Mm -hmm. poetry accessible and to use uh, simpler techniques like imagery which mm-hmm. anyone yeah. can can grasp onto an image. You don't have to be an English major or know all of these complex terms to understand what's going on in a William Carlos Williams poem. Mm-hmm. I would agree. So I'm going to let you start because I know that you read three books of poetry to discuss today. And so tell us the three titles first. And then I want to like, I'll let you jump in, but I'm just curious if there are some that are more accessible or are they all accessible? I think that that would be important for our Mm -hmm. listeners to know. Okay. Um, So I read two Rupi Kaur books. Um, One is called The Sun and Her Flowers and the other one is called Milk and Honey. And then I read another book um, by a poet, Sarah Kay, called No Matter the Wreckage. I love Sarah Kay. Yeah. I love her. (laughs) I mean, I if do you, too. and you probably don't know who she is. Uh, I don't. But I'm, I wonder if Taryn does. I don't know if Taryn's ever heard of her, but Taryn's shaking her head. No, <laughs> she's an amazing spoken word poet. Like she does yes. slam poetry and she has been all like you can YouTube her and find tons of videos and kids love her. They do. Um, so our good friend Dawn yes. told me about her. Um and had me go watch this YouTube video of Sarah Kay reading this poem. Taryn's shaking her head. Yes, yeah, Taryn's now. like, now I know, now I know. <laughs> um, so the poem is called B, and it's really about um, kind of if I were if I were to ever have a daughter, these are the things I would tell her. So that poem is in this book, um, and it's a great poem. But when you read the poem versus when you watch Sarah Kay perform the spoken word poem which you should go and do on YouTube. It's amazing the difference in how you hear things that are in that poem and the things that might stand out to you when you read it versus when you watch her perform it. It's just really interesting, I think. And she's really good. She's She's amazing. Yes. In fact, you watch that and you're just, I think anybody who has daughters, like you're, you're going to now have to see it. It is just, it's like, yeah, that's, that's exactly how I want. That's what I want to say to my daughter. So. Which is pretty amazing because the poem is, if I had a daughter, I, I don't think she has a daughter. She's so young. She's very young. When you see some of the earlier YouTube videos, like clearly she's not <laughs> had any children wow. yet. Oh, right. I'm excited to check that out. Yeah, it's great. So we um, showed that, Dawn and I showed that to our seniors and did a little activity with it. Um, and they really liked it. The kids really liked it. And it was the first time I had ever shown anything like that in class. So I wasn't really sure how the kids were going to react because... I don't know. Watching a spoken word poem can be a little, I don't know, squeamish. That's maybe not a great word, but kids might get a little embarrassed, you know, watching Mm -hmm. somebody perform a poem. Right. I don't know why I think that, but they're high school kids. And I don't know, sometimes things like that are a little awkward because maybe it's the emotion of it. Um, 
sometimes yeah. I have a harder time dealing with. But anyway, all my fears were set aside the second we started watching it. And the girls in class, even the boys in class were like, wow, that was really good. Yeah. She just kind of draws you in. Well, I think it, cha- sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, now that you mentioned that, Jamie, I was thinking back to our team years and you did something with the spoken word, po- a spoken spoken word poet because our team kids wrote them. And I remember Mario yes. writing one. <laughs> yeah. And I can't think of any of the other kids yeah. names off the top of my head now, but I remember doing that in the little courtyard there at yeah. Reed yeah. filming them. Yeah. And one of them, one of the kids, Christian, went on, he submitted his video for that to like our library, our, our museum in town. And he got some sort of award for oh, cool. videoing, not necessarily the poetry. That was like the medium, I guess. But um, so, yeah, it was interesting. But I, I feel like, cause I've done Sarah Kay in class and there's another guy, Shane something with a K. I'm going to have to look him up. Um, kids love him too. And I think because they talk about things that maybe are, um, taboo. It, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They just, nothing's off the table right. in spoken word. And it tends to be pretty raw and very vulnerable. I think kids identify with that. Mm-hmm. At least teenagers did. So yeah, I think they definitely do. Well, and <clears throat> I'll admit the poetry, um, podcast was my idea. So I'm sorry, Tams, <laughs> but oh, that's okay. I really, yeah. it, I, my, um, interest in it was sparked again when I watched Amanda Gorman at oh, yeah. the yeah. inauguration and watching her perform that poem was so amazing. And it kind of reminded me like, oh yeah, I used to do the Sarah Kay and I really wanted to read her book of poetry. And so it kind of, um, reignited my interest in that whole genre. I, I mm-hmm. ordered that book, by the way, it's not out until, well, it'll be out when this comes out, right? you know, but it's not out yet. So I loved watching her hands as yes. she spoke and how um, emotional her hands were. And I just, I thought it was fabulous. Yeah. It was fabulous. Mm-hmm. It was, it was a beautiful thing to watch, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, don't all presidential inaugurations have a poet? I, I don't know if that's a thing. Is that a thing? I think they're I feel only like... the Democrats. Really? Oh. Yeah. I read For somewhere real? about that. Yeah. Maybe we can have a couple people check that, but I yeah, think it's only the checks. Democrats. Look at Rob's over there. Here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's crazy and sad. I know. I'm not positive, so we'll be fact-checked yes. here quickly, yeah. but I, I read that somewhere. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Mm. So what did you think of her? I, I'm assuming there's more works in that book. Oh, there are. Um, real quick first, we do have an answer. Uh, just four presidents have included por- a poetry reading at their inaugurations. Oh. Only four. Okay. Who are the presidents? So uh, Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, and I assume that's going to say John F. Kennedy. It's cut off right there. So really? Democrats. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Come on, people. I know. The English teacher in me is like, oh, I think that should be a part of the program. Yeah. I agree. Always. You mm-hmm. know? Well, maybe with the popularity of what just happened with Amanda yeah. Gorman, yeah. maybe mm-hmm. it will be. Yeah. Kind of she set a new precedent for it. That would be lovely. So to get back to your book, yes, are there more work? Obviously, there's more works than just B in there. Right, there are. And I guess this is her um, kind of debut collection of poems. What I found interesting is um, as I was reading the poems, I realized in the back of the book, there are some notes about some of them. So she would say, you know, I performed this one at this time, or I wrote this one in this year. And so it was kind of interesting to go back and look at the notes um, that she provided for some of them. But I would say, I mean, all of the poems that I read in this collection were interesting and definitely a few of them that I'd like to go back um, and read again, just mm-hmm. because I think as I'm reading a collection of poetry, you kind of finish one and then you move on to the next and maybe don't really think as much about the one you just finished as you could. And so I think I marked a few that I'd like to go back and read again. Um, one in particular is called The Toothbrush to the Bicycle Tire. And I think it's probably one of her more famous ones in addition to B. I don't really know why. Um, I don't know if she's performed it somewhere or, or um, why people maybe grabbed onto this one, but it's pretty cute because it's a love letter between inanimate objects. But <laughs> when you read it, it definitely could be things that people would say to each other too. And that's the beauty of it is you could kind of read it on two different levels. There's the inanimate objects and then there's 
but wait, somebody really might feel that way or say that. I keep thinking like that would be a great like writing lesson for students to write. Absolutely. Two objects have a, you know, give it a persona. Right. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there you go. There's some more work for you. Right. Get on that. <laughs> that's <what I'm> <laughs> but that's fun work. <laughs> yeah, I know. Create a new poetry lesson. Um, my other favorite one that I'll comment on is called Mrs. Ribeiro. And um, so Sarah Kay, it sounds like, has done quite a bit of travel because of her poetry work. Um, so she actually started a group. Um, I wrote down the name of it. So it's uh, Project Voice. And her group goes around and teaches poetry to students and they do a workshop with the students. And so it sounds like she's done a lot of traveling because of that. But she spent some time in India and I'm not sure if that was for that or because she was workshopping herself. But um, she's at a school and it reminds her of her principal when she was just five years old. And she describes this woman who was her principal in her school. And I think she grew up in New York City. Um, So she talks about this woman um, and how inspiring she was to the students. And of course, that's something that you would remember. And it's so cool that she wrote a poem about her principal. Like, how great is that? Yeah. And just commenting on the things she learned and the way she felt the way the principal made them feel so important, which you is know, just so cool. What I love about that is I think since we're all in the teaching biz and have been for a long time in one way or another, I feel like so much of the work we do, we don't know if there's, if we made the connection, if, if the moment was there, if they had that learning moment or if they even felt valued. And I, right. I bet you Mrs. Ribeiro feels pretty darn. Can you imagine right. if one of our students said, I wrote a poem and like, but they were fa- like they're famous because Sarah Kay is right. famous and it's in my book and it's about you. I'd be like, I might cry. I'd be like, somebody oh, yeah. read that at my funeral, please. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> I, well, it, what a great yeah. honor. Yeah. I mean, and just the, th- this sounds like this principal deserved it. Um, she did some great things for the kids that they remembered, um, including I'll just comment on one of the things she talks about in this poem, which is that Mrs. Ribeiro got a petting zoo um, set up in the parking lot of their school. And she wow. decided that she really wanted to take one of the animals up to the kids because the kids didn't know this was happening. So she wanted to take one of the animals up to the kids to show them and then have them all come down to the petting <laughs> zoo. So she brought a lamb, a llama up to the classroom. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I think it might have had to ride in an elevator <laughs> to get up to the classroom. She brought the oh llama gosh. up to the kids. That I mean, that's pretty great. memorable. Oh, that that's is pretty amazing. Yeah, pretty sweet. That's, that's, that makes my heart feel good. It does. Yeah. Lots of lives are changing in education right there. (laughs) Right. Um, So I will say one other thing I liked about this book is that I think the poetry is really accessible. So I feel like anybody could pick up this book and read and enjoy the poems. You don't have to be an English teacher or an English major, but she does a really good job with the poetry of, um, you know, using her metaphors and her similes and her imagery um, to talk about things, to talk about her topics and her poems and make you think a little bit on a deeper level, but very accessible. That's great. Okay. So what else did you read? So the other two that I read are the two by Rupi Kaur. So the sun and her flowers and milk and honey. So, you know, milk and honey, like some people don't want it on the shelf. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> and um, I, it's funny because I've had people make comments to me about like, have you seen the inside of that book? And you know how, you all know how I feel about that. Like, I'm like, oh, should I order another copy? That's code for <laughs> I should order another copy. It goes out all the time. I'm sure it does. It's very, very popular in my classroom with students when I ask them to bring a book for reading time. I've had many students bring that. And Tammy, did you read that one? I have read that one. I okay. have. I think the first time I picked it up, I happened to open to, to a very, uh huh, very, and I was like, wow, what? And then, of course, as you go through reading it, it is really the story of you know, th- this relationship that has gone wrong and, and the recovery from that. And so I, th- I think that's why kids really are drawn to it because of the damage and the repair and trying to figure out, at least that's me, you know, trying to talk about <laughs> poetry that's intimidating, but I did enjoy it. I just, with the line drawings, I was like, oh boy. Yeah. I haven't read it yet. So 
but I had a, a student who loved it and she wanted me to read it. And of course I will, but you know, the, you know, the, the problem, the stack. I do know the problem. The good thing about that and the other, the sun and her flowers is you could read each of them in one sitting. Yeah. They're quick. The, the poems are very short mm-hmm. on the pages. There's only a few that maybe, you know, take up a full page or even a couple of pages, right. but the rest of the poems are very short. Um, and then there's the kind of line drawings throughout, mm-hmm. which I was not expecting because I, I know some of my students who have read the books and I never got a sense of anything that was going to be surprising in those mm-hmm. drawings. <laughs> right, right. And so I was, I was not prepared for that. I did not know. I, it's fine. Um, I don't have yeah. a problem with it, but it just, I definitely wasn't prepared for it. And it makes sense, like you were saying, Tammy, with the storyline. I would say The Sun and Her Flowers is very, very similar. Very similar storyline. Um, there was one section in The Sun and Her Flowers that I really enjoyed, Um that was a little bit more about um, immigration and being from a family of immigrants, which I think is just timely, you know, yes, in our right. world right now um, to to read about that and to read about those perspectives. I did enjoy that. Um, the rest of, of The Sun and Her Flowers and Milk and Honey, I feel like were really just about kind of relationships and heartbreak and even a little abuse. And mm-hmm. um, so I can see why especially maybe teenage girls would be drawn to that because I think it captures a lot of the feelings that you might have. Right, right. I would say I didn't enjoy those as much um, as a, I enjoyed Sarah Kay's book. I think Sarah Kay's book is maybe one notch above, um, maybe more something that an adult might enjoy more um, or an advanced right. reader might enjoy more. Again, I think it's really accessible, um, but the Rupi Kaur books are definitely very accessible for a younger audience audience she has a new one coming out called homebody i just mm. ordered it so i don't know when it'll come in because i'd ordered it from a slower um vendor oh dear trying to finish out my budget and i saw that just because um she is so popular and i you're right i think she speaks um really well to that unique audience, especially young girls. And I think that we need more voices that speak to those, those young girls. And so I ordered it thinking it's probably going to be really good, but you're right. I'm going to read it now. I'm going to take it home tonight and just blow through it because it's pretty fast. You'll finish it quickly. Um, The other thing that I will say about the Rupi Kaur books is that I read a little bit about her and there's a little bit of pushback um, about her poetry, not Mm -hmm. really being poetry. So people were critical of, well, if I just space words out on a page, then I guess I can call myself a poet. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) I know. So I was trying to think about why people felt that way about that that particular author and maybe weren't saying quite the same things about Sarah Kay. And the conclusion that I could come to is that I think Sarah Kay does use the elements of poetry a little bit more right. like that imagery and metaphor and simile maybe than Rupi Kaur does or when Rupi Kaur does it's a little more surface level um than when somebody like Sarah Kay does well that brings up a really interesting question because then I think about all these books that are, are stories that are these narratives that are written in poetry like our famous Ellen Hopkins and those go out the door all the time and I've never right. really th- sat down to think about like are there elements or devices of poetry that are being used or is it just written in like poetic, like a form, you know, how they make shapes and stuff like that. I hadn't, I'd never even given that any thought. I thought about it after, especially after I read all of these and I had also just reread um, a Jason Reynolds book. Yeah. And so I was kind of, and I've read many Ellen Hopkins books and, and I think that writing in verse in that way is very accessible to kids. kids. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that. And I enjoy it, but I also don't know that if you were going to hold it up to like a definition of poetry, if right. it would stand up quite as well. Um, but and that's not a criticism; it just is what it is. Well, it's almost like I mean the debate between um, that we have next week when we're talking about micro histories and what makes like okay, so what makes a book of poetry poetry, and do we have a new classification being birthed? I don't know that Ellen Hopkins was necessarily like the founder of this type of thing, but when you're telling a story and a narrative and it's the whole story is the entire book, but it's in this poetic form, is that something different? Does it deserve its own definition? 
I don't know. You know, it's interesting because I think her books were the beginnings yeah. of that where kids really were not just drawn to the the subject matter, the but content. to the, the form and reluctant readers when you'd hand it to them and their eyes would just get huge because the books yeah. are so thick and you're like, but wait. Yeah. And then they felt like they could consume it. Yeah. And understand because it really is. I think if you squish it all onto pages, it's probably like 120 pages, maybe. Yeah. But there's something about, I think, the way that it is written, you know, with the pictures, the images in it, and her craft of uh, precise language yeah. in, in selecting, yeah. you know, the, the words for the few sentences to to really give the, the elements of the story that she's not fleshing out, but you still understand. Yeah. I don't know. Well, maybe that's more along the lines of a poetry definition. So it's probably not fair to say it's not poetry. And and a lot of the criticism that's come out about some of those types of writers, I think it's probably not fair to say, well, it's not poetry, but it also isn't, you know, yeah. a, a longer poem with a lot of, you know, um, metaphor and simile and imagery and all that in it. But I also think if it's something that gets kids interested in reading, thank you. You mm-hmm. can't criticize it at all, right? Because right. those books are very compelling and super popular with. I mean, students. and we circle back to the most important thing is if it draws a reader in. Do we really care what the definition of the right. genre is? Right. Right. Not really. No. So I think it is wonderful for students. Well, and adults too, to have all of these different types of, um, you know, ways to experience poetry. I think of school here, since we're, since we're in the same high school, we did sonnets. We did some very, like the old fashioned poets. I can't even think of names that I can, can drop, but those poems didn't stick with me. But when I think of Rupi Kaur or Sarah Kay or the book I'll, you know, speak about those, I think will stay with me because I can make a connection to them in a way I couldn't with some of the others. So you loved your books, your poetry books. I did. I loved the Sarah Kay book the most. I enjoyed the Rupi Kaur books. Okay. Excellent. Hey listeners, we're pausing for just a minute and reminding you about our social media. That's right. We want to make sure that you are following us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook because we have all kinds of interesting things that happen on those social media sites. It's a strange new world and we post a lot of weird things up there, but great things, book-related things, things about us. Right. And we know you like us and we'd appreciate if you go over to Podchaser and CastBox and leave us a review that helps others find our little podcast. That's right. Okay, Amy, your turn. My Tell turn. us about the books that you, book or books that I you read, read. Well, I read one, but you okay. know, I'm because I come from the English background, you know yes. that I love poetry like as much as Jamie does. I should say this with like a caveat. I, I, I really appreciate accessible poetry, which is I think why I gravitated towards WCW, William Carlos Williams, because I think that he's kind of an older generation poet, like Robert Frost, that kind of generation that when you read it, you, it's very concrete it's easy to understand and it's easy to kind of apply it to your life. And I think that's what I like about poetry is maybe the application and how it, I don't know, how it, what, how it speaks to you in your current life, I guess. So um, the poet that I chose, which I was really excited about, you know who I chose, right? I do. Billy Collins. Yes. So I was walking around, I was rolling through Barnes and Noble doing my book shopping that I like to do. And I stumbled across his book, which is called Whale Day. And it just came out. Hold on, I got to show you this. Well, and while you're grabbing that, I'm just going to say we, just to tell everyone, we heard him read his own poetry at the Tucson Festival of Books a few years back. that's so cool. And I have a terrible picture of myself with (laughs) Billy Collins, but I am going to put it on. I'm like, I feel like I don't look great in the picture. But listen, it's not about me. It's about the art, and I'm going to suffer for it. So it's going to go on Instagram. (laughs) He is, I don't know, probably my dad's generation. Like, he's much older. And he was America's Poet Laureate. So, I mean, he's, he's reputable. He's a good guy. I... Okay, we went to the Tucson Festival of Books, mm-hmm. and which is in like, was it March or? I think so. Okay. Yeah. So Tucson in March is lovely. It's warm. And here's what I think we discovered about the, I'm like, why would they have a festival? Like what draws people to Tucson? 
Um, it's the weather because there's a bunch of, what do they call them? Snowbirds? Yes. Snowbirds. Mm -hmm. So people who are probably coming from up in Minnesota where it's freezing cold and they come down here. And here's how I know that that's the demographic because we were waiting in line to go see like Billy Collins and Mitch Abloom and Mm -hmm. Veronica Ross. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. so we had to wait because you can get tickets for free. Yeah. Which we didn't for some reason we couldn't get a ticket. So then you had to wait in line. And they would let like, oh, well, we have 200 seats available. And if you're the first 200 people in line, you get in. So I felt like Billy Collins was worth the wait. So we waited in line. And when you look around, God bless all these people, you could tell there's like <laughs> these, they they have a look. Okay. And the look is they look like they went to REI and shopped because they have like those, you know, the, the shirts that are kind of like the, the special weave fabric that wick away. They look like they're out hiking and they've got the big brimmed hats and they have the pants that have the zip off legs so that they go into shorts and they've got their like tough shoes on. So you can tell these, <laughs> but they're all like sixties, seventies, maybe eighties. Cause there are some canes, a couple walkers things. <laughs> Were you the two youngest I mean, okay, listen, anytime we go to anything library-like, it feels like we're the youngest. We're probably not, but I'm like, man, this is an old crowd. So They did have kind of a kid section because they did have more of the yes. picture books and stuff, but it, it clearly was really our demographic and, and older, but then... I guess if you brought your grandkids or if yeah. you had, if you were 30 something, you know, and really you were bookish, you maybe bring your kids. Yeah. Right. yeah. It was, but it was like, it's worthwhile to go to. You guys would dig it. Oh you yeah. Would it, sounds it. Like it. it was cool because then you get into this big room, this ballroom and you get to listen to them just talk about their craft. And so we listened to Billy Collins. Um, my favorite one that he read was called The Lanyard. Do you remember that? I do because I was like, oh, poetry. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, here we go. True friend right here. True friend. So, you know, and then we waited in line. We sat there and he started and I was like, wow. I remember looking over and Amy was like, right? (laughs) And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's so good. It's just great. Yeah. He he just, then I came home and of course I had to look up and find a copy of The Lanyard, which I will, I'll find it for you guys because you would really appreciate it. It's this sweet poem about, you know, when you went to camp, summer camp, and you made your mom like a bunch of those lanyards, you know, out of the little wire yeah. thing. Yeah, and, that you wove. Right. And your mom's mm-hmm. like, great. <laughs> and then they're li- like all those things that we give our moms. But really, like, I still have some of the things my kids made me. They weren't lanyards necessarily, but on the side of my bed, I have this weird little potter plant that Katie made with this flower. And it, I mean, I think if anybody looked at it, they'd be like, throw that in the trash. I mean, immediately, but I can't get rid of it. I I just can't get rid of it. And so it really spoke to like, you know, being a kid and giving your mom something and then being a mom and having your kid make you something that is just, it's priceless. And so, um, I sent that out, that particular thing out to all the staff and you know, who loved it is Rebecca. Oh, I bet. She's like, sounds that like... is the greatest poem ever. And I'm like, you know, I love her because she's so thoughtful. Yes. So, well, Bill- she also um, is who introduced me. She probably doesn't even know this, but she's the person who introduced me to Billy Collins because really, yes, at the beginning of our poetry unit, she had a poem by Billy Collins and I read it and I was like, this poem's so great. And I'm going to struggle to remember the name of it, but it was, it's a poem about poetry and about mm-hmm. how as teachers we try to like, you know, beat kids over the head with yeah. it and make people like Tammy feel intimidated. <laughs> and, but really it's not, it's a lot simpler than that. And I love that poem and the kids love the poem. And so she, I have to credit. We gonna have to find, we're going to have to find that poem. We'll put it into show notes, but he is, I think he's a genius because he's a lot like WCW in that he's writing stuff that like any person could pick up. They're not these super long, like the poem is the size of a book. It's just something you can pick up, sit down and enjoy. And I think that's what I loved about whale days or whale day and other poems. It, it's a, you just literally sit here and like the page is the poem, maybe two pages. And then that's it. So you can see I have it all dog-eared because mm-hmm. not dog-eared. I would never do that to a book. <laughs> Please. Tammy knows. <laughs> Tammy knows I'm lying right now. Yeah. She's like, why do you do that? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, there's some really good ones in here, but one that I love because I'm into dogs is called Walking My 75-Year-Old Dog. And the way he describes the way the the dog looks at him with like the rummy eyes and like the saggy, you know, lids. I just thought, oh gosh, 
that's my dog. Those are my dogs. My dogs have that same thing. And I don't know. I just, I was so touched by so many of the poems in here. And I think that, um, he's done a, a great service to our country because he's not just a poet who writes. He's also, uh, an editor who puts together collections that I think are equally as accessible, which we'll talk about in the mini sode next time around. But I love Billy Collins. I think he's fabulous. And I forget about that, but I think you're right. He is amazing. Mm-hmm. I would read a whole book of Billy Collins. I'm going to give you I've forgotten book. about that. Yes. And I, it's funny because we bought a bunch of books when, when we were at the Tucson Festival of Books. Mm-hmm. And so I, I bought um, The Rain in Portugal, which was the one that I think he had published right when we went to that event. And I've read quite a bit of that as well, but I just think... Didn't he sign a book or two for you too? Oh my gosh, he did. Cause we, so after we listened to him, I said, we gotta, we gotta get in the, in the line. And I'm sure we were with Kim and Kim was like, really? You know, <laughs> but our youth, which I say in air quotes, our youth was with us that day because we could get ahead of all those other oh, folks nice. and yes. get early in that we, line. I think we were like, we were, we were right like up in the front. or something. Yeah, yeah we, we were, were right way up close. Can I just tell you? you? Yeah, because we blew past the people with their walkers. Right. We we're like, we're, oh, come on. And so he did sign. I'll have to pull those and mm-hmm. take some pictures of them. It was really cool. And he was, I, you could tell though, because he's a little bit older, he was probably like, okay, let's get this thing going. <laughs> like my 30s seconds with Billy Collins. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's, he's fabulous, but, um, I cannot say enough about this. And, and I like how, I think I could hand it to a kid too, whether they're a teenager or an adult. And I don't think it would be overwhelming because you can literally get through it. Look how small it is. It is. And also the, the cover of it just looks like is the it cover of a poetry book. I know <laughs> that big old whale on yeah. the front. So there's some stuff in here that I would highly recommend picking up. But I, that's the thing about poetry. I think that something that strikes me isn't necessarily something that like you're going to pick up the same book, but you're going to read a different poem that I blew past and didn't. It's, it's almost like when you listen to music and you're listening to an entire disc, right, of like an, an album. And I love this song. But then you listen to it and you're like, well, did you listen to the B side and listen to this song? Because that is the best. And then you go back and you listen to it with fresh ears. You're like, you're right. This is clearly the best song. And I think that that's what poetry is. It's a lot like music. It It's like this, mo- you open it up and you you have this experience with the poem because of something that's happening in your own life, but then you pass it off to a friend and they tell you, well, did you see the other one in there? And you go back and read it with fresh eyes. So I don't know. Does that make sense? It does. I think Mm -hmm. that's a really good analogy about poetry and especially about reading a whole book of poetry that there are going to be some that speak to you Mm -hmm. and some that it's kind of why we read anyway, right? Is because it makes connections to our lives Mm -hmm. and we enjoy that. And so there are going to be some that do that for you and others that do that for somebody else. And poems are so short that you can read a bunch of them and pick out the ones that are your favorite. Well, and the good thing about this is you can blow through a book of poetry and put it on your Goodreads and (laughs) hey girl, there's one closer (laughs) to your goal. I mean, it's a different reading experience, but I do feel like you come back to poetry in a way that you don't maybe necessarily with prose. I mean, I go back and read books sometimes, but you can come back and read a poem like The Lanyard several times and it, it always speaks to you or it speaks to you even more profoundly or so anyway. That's what I read. I read I Whale it. Day by Billy Collins. I highly recommend published in 2020. Nice. Tams, you read something new too. I did. And I wanted to start with um, the title is Black Girl Call Home by Jasmine Manns. And I wanted to thank NetGalley and Berkeley Publishing for the, um, the, arc. the arc of it. And I was so excited when I saw this on, it was Oprah Magazine's, I think, list of books that were coming out. And I, I will tell you, I when I asked for it from NetGalley and I didn't immediately get it, I'm like, oh. <laughs> so like, I'm waiting and waiting. And then Taryn goes, well, let's, you know, go in and, and, you know, really look at what they're looking for. So we did, adjusted that. And then I got it like within 10 minutes after doing that. You were really happy about that. I was super happy. And it was in the afternoon. And by seven o'clock, I'd read the whole thing. I just really consumed it in much the way I think the um, Sarah, is it Sarah Kay? Mm-hmm. The Sarah Kay book was for you. And I feel like this is something I would go back and read because I did read them so quickly, just reading one after the other. I feel like I want to go back and then read it slower mm-hmm. and really 
think about the way that she crafted it and her word choice. She is a spoken word poet and her collection has really so many different things. It has found word poetry, which I used with my students yeah. when in history because I was thinking of one of them and it was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire and they read an, an article about it. But I had them in order to summarize it or to synthesize it. They had to, you know, highlight yeah. on the on the article, and then they used that to create their piece of poetry that told the story. But then it, the impact to the to the women and to the people, their mm-hmm. families. So she does that in one of them that I loved, and it was called Birmingham, and it's about the Birmingham church bombing where the four girls were killed. And so she she uses pieces of that story, and then inserts herself into that story about, you know, I'm, and she's not the age of that, but clearly she's writing about, um, you know, the black woman experience. And so she has, she writes about, is that going to be me? You know, they, there they were with their, their, you know, shoes and, you know, just all those things that you think about when children get dressed up and go to church and then, you know, her mother saying, no, you know, it's not you. And so I loved that poem. There's a haiku in there. There are aphorisms in there. Wow. It just is a a variety of different styles of, of poetry. Uh, There's another one or several actually where I've started calling it sort of the geography of family because her poems were written about her grandmother's house on South 14th street. And so, you know, she would talk about the olive green house and our house, our first house here in Reno was olive green. And I just felt this connection to her writing about her grandmother and the place where these memories are. And then when grandma got older, is this her first, her first book or, do you mm, know, I don't know if it's her first book or not, okay. if it's her first collection. Um, my guess would be no, but as a spoken word poet, maybe, you know, right. she had spoken right. it in different, different places, but maybe not, you know, was pulled together in a, as a collection. So the, the theme of family runs through this, mm-hmm. where she talks about the different locations of, you know, whether it's Nana's kitchen or her auntie's, you know, home in Oklahoma, all of these things that made me think about, how would I, how does it, you know, what, what are the memories I have for the places? And it made me go to my grandmother's house and, you know, in California and the place that, you know, we had specific kind of pancakes that she made us. And, and then it, you know, brought me here when we first moved here. And I, I felt that connection, like I can do this, you know, Mm -hmm. this is something that is accessible to me. And I thought kids would really love this. And then, the, you know, if you had them read it, especially if you pulled the collection of sort of the geography of family and then kids wrote about. I was just thinking like this sounds like a great family. Yeah. book to use to teach with. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And there's more. She is a black queer woman that has struggled with finding her voice and, um, you know, just all of the issues faced with being a a woman of color and then being a queer woman. Mm -hmm. And those are in there. And I think that that's uh, important for kids to, to read and and, um, experience too. So it's, I loved it. I was so happy to have received it and to um, have read it. One of the things I want to talk about is the cover. Yeah. It's a beautiful cover and it's the back of a black woman or child, young woman, And her hair is braided and it has the colorful barrettes like you often will see young um, black girls with their hair. And one of the poems she writes about is that she wished wished that they hadn't spent so much time on their hair. Like on the weekends, she said by the time, you know, it was hours to braid and we were so concerned about how we looked. She said, what were we missing in our education that we spent so much time Mm -hmm. really on the grooming of our hair because it was so important. And she said, I want to reach out to girls. And and she's speaking to, you you know, young black women about not worrying so much about your hair being perfect and embracing just what your hair looks like naturally and to be more in the moment and and I loved all of that I thought that it was very powerful oh so that's that's a great great. message yeah Yeah, it was a total five for me and I you know it obviously brought me back to Amanda Gorman that you mentioned and her poetry and I just thought it was I thought there would be so much you could do with this in the classroom when does it publish? It published March 9th. March 9th. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So here's what I think. I 
I think that spoken word poetry is kind of like the new medium of poetry. It really is. And when you think about like poetry out loud, that really is getting kids to memorize, maybe I don't want to call it an old time poem, but memorize somebody else's poetry, but then they get up and they perform it. Mm -hmm. Right. How much, how many people, how I think about that event giving birth to all these perhaps spoken word poetry, um, people like Sarah Kay. Right. Well, in her, um, her organization that she runs, yeah. um, I've just lost, I can't remember the name, Project Voice. Um, she, you can book her to come to your school. Can you imagine? Oh, oh my wow. gosh. And I was looking at that because I went and looked on her website and that's where I found that. And I was like, oh, I that wonder, would be so great to have her come. And they're doing virtual um, bookings right now, which is also so great that they're yeah. finding a way to make it work right now under the current circumstances. But you could tell there were some videos and there was, you know, some pictures of stuff and um, she talks about, you know, helping some of these students write their poems and then speak their poems out loud. And it just seemed so great. I was like, oh, that would be so amazing to do that with a group of students at some point. I wonder, too, if a lot of people, like, because they were spoken word poets and then they put their stuff on YouTube, which is really a free place to put your art, your work, mm-hmm. your collection, and it starts to get some traction I wonder how many poets we have now because we have, we've had YouTube because would those people have been represented in publishing if they didn't already have like, Oh, well people like that. So let's get that person to put that stuff into a book and put it out there so that people who want to read it as opposed to view it or read it and view it, you know, it's really, it really allows so many different voices to enter into the genre of poetry. I agree. So Excellent. Well, one more time on all of our titles. Okay. What were yours, Jay? Uh, so I had No Matter the Wreckage by Sarah Kay. Okay. And then also The Sun and Her Flowers and Milk and Honey by Rupi, Rupi Cower. Okay. And I had Whale Day and Other Poems by Billy Collins. And I had Black Girl Call Home by Jasmine Manns. Awesome. All right. Before we go, I'm going to pull a question from our jar of questions. Yeah. And this is something that we all contributed to. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm <laughs> it's so random, but I love the idea of just like these random. Random questions. Yeah. Okay. So who is a character that you'd like to be friends with in real life? Whose question was this? It was Jamie. I, I think that was mine. Was that yours? I think so. Okay. So I'm going to make you answer it first. Oh, well, I should have thought of an answer when I thought of the question. <laughs> <laughs> I was really interested to hear everybody else's answer. Okay. Who's a character I'd want to be friends with in real life? Well, there's probably a lot. Um, hmm. I'm going to go with Scout from To Kill a Mockingbird. Okay, excellent. Oh, That's I good. Because that. yeah. Yeah. I think she would be a lot of fun to be around. Absolutely. I think you'd yeah. have a good time. Yeah. yeah, you'd have fun. Okay, Tams. Okay, so the first person that came to mind, you'll laugh, Amy, but it is the character from um, Discovery of Witches. Yeah. Yeah. Deborah uh, Hartnett. Di- yeah, she wrote it. <laughs> yeah, so it's um, Diana Bishop. Okay. And she's a witch. Oh, okay. Look so at you. It would be really interesting to be friends with a witch that could, and they're all good witches. I mean, it's just, you know, being able to grab a book off a shelf or whatever, but she's an academic herself. She's a historian. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. You guys would have a lot to talk about. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the first one, I'm going to go with my first response. The first character that popped into my head was Rudy from the book Thief, because oh. I just felt like he was... He was so, I mean, like sad, tragic end, but so much fun and such a faithful yes. friend and scrappy as yes. all get out. And I just liked his scrappiness. I think he'd be fun to run around with and uh, get into trouble. So I agree. That's, that's that great. would be mine. Thanks for spending time with us today. And Jamie, thank you so much for being here to contribute on our poetry roundtable discussion. Thank you. We're bringing you four more poetry choices for our Friday Four from the Cirque Desk this week, too. Before we go, check us out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We know you like us, so please head over to Podchaser and CastBox and leave us a review. This helps others find our little show. And if you're listening on Apple, click right here in the link in the show notes below. See See you in the stacks. stacks!